Hi guys, welcome back to another Hugh Jeffries video. In this video, I'm going to be restoring this original MacBook Air from 2008. Whether you liked it or not, this Mac pioneered the future of Apple computers, with only one USB port, no DVD drive, and non-upgradable RAM. This one is needing some work. It has no operating system, it shuts off when unplugged, and the exterior is dirty and dinted, with the LCD lid catching and rubbing against the lower part of the laptop. And you can tell somebody has been on the inside as the bottom case hasn't been correctly reinstalled. This laptop came as part of a 26 kilo MacBook lot that I recently purchased for 370 US dollars. Shout out to John from Roadkill Incorporated for hooking me up with these MacBooks. John buys hundreds of MacBooks from recyclers in various states from working to completely destroyed. Like me, John supports right to repair and does his best to keep devices out of landfill. Check out his YouTube and social links down below. If you're also interested in seeing that tech lot video, that will be down there as well. To get started, I'll begin by installing an operating system. As internet recovery didn't work, I'll be cloning an old hard drive with macOS 10 line already installed. To do that, I booted into the external drive via USB on the Mac and used Carbon Copy Cloner to copy the external drive's contents to the internal drive of the laptop. After completing, I could boot back onto the external drive inside the MacBook and we can see we now have an operating system reinstalled. With that now done, we can move on to the technical portion of the video where we're going to be replacing the battery, doing some cleaning, reapplying the thermal paste, and trying to remove some of the damage to the exterior of the casing. To begin, I'm going to remove the bottom panel where we can replace the aging battery, which not only doesn't hold a charge, but also isn't detected by the computer. Internally, we can see it's actually quite clean, especially for a laptop of this age. I'll start by disconnecting the old battery and unscrewing the several Phillips head screws holding it down into place. Unlike modern Apple laptops, there's no glue involved here, so the removal process is quite easy. There's no prying and bending of the battery, it simply comes right out. For a replacement battery, I've chosen this one from 2Power. I've used their batteries in the past and found they have decent run times. It is cosmetically different from the original, however that won't affect performance. This battery cost me 100 Australian dollars, which isn't cheap for a vintage laptop like this one, but I wanted a working battery as this laptop is for my collection. Placing it down into place, I can reinstall all of the screws securing it down. Next up, I can reconnect the main connection to the logic board and test out the laptop. Flipping it over, lifting up the lid and pressing the power button, thankfully the computer boots up off of its own charge. Now that that's out of the way, we can disconnect the battery once again and I can start disassembling the laptop so we can reapply the thermal paste on the CPU and GPU. I'll start by disconnecting various flex cables and removing the internal hard drive. I'll need to undo its screws disconnect the speaker cable, and carefully lift up the flex cable which is adhered into place. With all that done, I found I still couldn't remove the hard drive. As it turns out, there's a piece of plastic hiding one more screw. After that's removed, I was able to take out the hard drive. If you take a closer look at it, it might look a little bit familiar to something you'll find in an Apple iPod. Sure enough, this is an identical hard drive to one in an iPod Classic. This means you most likely can convert this to an MSATA or even an SD card to install macOS on. I won't be doing this with my MacBook Air as while well, adding an SSD to my iPod eliminated the spin up time of the hard drive when skipping songs, it still output the same read and write speeds. As the MacBook uses the same IDE interface, it's likely I won't see much of a speed increase. And given the whole upgrade would cost around $100, I didn't see it as a worthy investment into the laptop. But with that hard drive out of the way, it's time to get the heatsink removed. Removing several screws and a little cover over the fan, I can disconnect a cable and undo one more screw before disconnecting the fan and removing the entire heatsink and fan assembly as one piece. Getting our first look at the thermal paste, there seems to be quite a lot applied. There is a chance that someone has changed it before. As for the heatsink, I noticed a few strange things. A regular one has a series of fins which the fan blows air through to push hot air out of a computer. 
In the MacBook Air, there's no fins or even an outlet for the fan, so it appears to only be pushing air above it. As for the heat pipe connecting to the fan, it's very thin, although it's still more than what's in the latest MacBook Air, which doesn't even have a heat pipe connecting the heat sink to the fan. Moving along, I'll need to remove all the old thermal compound from the heatsink and the processors. To do this, I use some cleaning alcohol, a Q-tip, and a paper towel. On the logic board side of things, you'll need to be more careful when cleaning off the old thermal compound, as the CPU and GPU contain little components on top, and you don't want to dislodge those whilst cleaning. After we've got those sparkling, I can apply some new thermal compound to both the chips. Reinstalling our heatsink, we can start reassembling the MacBook Air. After we reinstall our iPod hard drive and screw it down into place, we'll need to route a little cable that goes along the back of that before reconnecting it to the logic board. Reconnecting the cable for the mono speaker, I can then reconnect the flex cables going to the hard drive and the ports. There's also a little cover which goes over one of the hard drive screws. And after that, it's time to give the internals of this MacBook Air a good clean with some alcohol and remove any fingerprints or grime that are inside the laptop. I'll also give the MagSafe port a good clean at this point, as a lot of the buildup on these MagSafe connections is dirt which can be removed. Connecting our new battery into place, the internals of this MacBook are ready to go. Now I didn't upgrade the hard drive, as like I said earlier, it's not worth it in such an old computer. And as for that memory, it is soldered into place and is non-user upgradable, just like all the modern Macs. I'll need to clean the bottom panel before I reinstall it onto the MacBook so it is looking as good as it can. Correctly aligning the front, I can press it down into place and reinstall all of the screws. Unfortunately, the screw in the lower left hand corner would not screw back into place as the thread itself was actually damaged. So our MacBook is now working on the inside. It's got a functional battery. It's got some new thermal paste and a good clean. However, the outside is still needing some attention. So the first thing I'm going to address is the scraping of the LCD lid against the bottom case. As the laptop is made out of the same material as tin cans, aluminium, we can easily bend it back. Using a pair of needle nose pliers wrapped in a microfiber cloth, I will carefully begin bending it back into place. You need to do this slowly as applying too much force can cause the casing to snap or crease. But two minutes later, it's looking much better and is no longer scraping. However, this won't remove any of the scratches that this laptop has. The last thing I'll need to do is give the laptop a good clean. It is quite dusty and has a bit of grime on it. Using some more alcohol, I can clean it up and make it look quite nice. If you purchase any electronics used, you should always clean them before use as you don't know where they've been or what they've been subject to. I was quite surprised at this stage as a lot of the marks on the exterior casing that I previously thought were scratches that I wouldn't be able to remove turned out to be just grime and dirt buildup, so the laptop ended up looking a lot nicer than I thought it would originally. And after a good clean, we're done. So this is it. A hundred dollars later, I have a functional original MacBook Air for my collection. Being a first generation product, it has some weird quirks, such as the port door, which houses a headphone jack, USB, and micro DVI. The charger port is also on an angle, and it still has an eject key, even though it doesn't even have a DVD drive. Unfortunately, this laptop shaped the way to unupgradable, unfixable, portless laptops. Internally, it's got a 1.6 GHz Intel Core 2 Duo with two gigs of RAM and Intel GMA graphics. So it is definitely far from a powerhouse, and this was one of Apple's most expensive laptops back in 2008. And as for that heat sink that I mentioned earlier, at an idle temperature of around 90 degrees, this thing is no cool laptop. The heat sink itself gets really hot, so the thermal compound is doing its job, but the heat transfer to the fan to be properly dissipated just doesn't happen. 
So this laptop naturally runs really hot, even with a fan control lap. As for our new battery, I was able to get two and a half hours of video playback at 50% brightness. You may have noticed the screen flickering throughout the video. This is an issue with my camera, not the laptop. And on that note, this has been a Hugh Jeffries video. If you like what you saw, hit that subscribe button and consider checking out the computer playlist for more videos just like this one. And if you're looking for some helpful tips or what tools I use to repair devices, be sure to check out my website, link for which is down in the description. That's all for this video and I'll catch you guys next time.